You're listening to the Jam Fry Show, all about movies. And today, my guest is president of Fandor and the film detective, Phil Hopkins. Welcome to the show, Phil. Hey, Jen. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. Boy, we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> a oh. lot. I want to first know, um, how did you become known as the mad cinephile? I guess it started when I was um, a wee lad of uh, probably five or six. So if you remember, um, you know, back in the day before we had TikTok and cell phones and all that stuff, uh, we had uncles or grandparents that had home movies. And it was a wonderful thing because you could get the whole family together and have this sort of experience where you could look back and say, hey, that was our summer vacation. That was our trip. Um, and my family started making home movies on 16 millimeter film uh, back in the 1920s. And as a, as a little kid, you know, kind of watching those films with my aging relatives, I became fascinated by seeing my relatives, which at that time were all in their 60s and 70s as young people, but more importantly, seeing my dad as a little kid like me, I was completely fascinated by it. So I became obsessed with the old movies as they referred to them. And over time, I became the, I guess the family custodian of the film collection, which was several hundred reels of 16 millimeter film. So that's that was sort of the beginning of the bug. And then of course, when I got to the point where I wanted to show these old movies again, they had seen them a hundred times and they really um, were kind of exhausted by it. So one of the ways I could trick my family into watching film would be to acquire old 16 millimeter copies of Charlie Chaplin films or Keystone Cop films, and then still sneak in the home movies. So I, I guess that, that whole mad cinephile moniker um, goes back to the, <laughs> the, the very beginning. You come by it honestly, then, from from what you're from gathering all of this. You've also been very involved with film restoration, um, and I just saw a film, and I don't know if you were in it or not. Um, it was entitled. I want to make sure I got it right. Um, it was a documentary at the Santa Barbara Film Festival that we just had, and it uh, was entitled "Film: The Living Record of Our Memory." Are you familiar with that film? Were you involved in it in any way? I was not, but it sounds like something I should definitely know about. Yes, definitely. I thought when I was reading your, you know, your bio and your background, I immediately thought of this film and you. So yes, you should um, definitely be, seek it out. Uh, definitely, because you've been involved. With, so that's a big. I mean, this film would be right up your alley because it's it's they are like film detectives actually, <laughs> just like your your uh, channel, the film detective, where they actually were uh, all over the world. All of these people who um, have been invo involved with restoration, finding little bits and pieces, and trying to figure out and putting it together. It was fascinating. It was that I'd love to see it. The uh, the whole idea of um lost cinema if you think about the early part of our silent film history so much of that is destroyed or missing forever um the library of congress actually has a wonderful um program called mostly lost and film fanatics and you know other film detectives they go to this event where they show fragments of film and then people will actually try to hone in on who's in the movie, where it was shot, to try to piece together what the fragments were from. And, you know, this is a great, you know, sort of service for um, all of us to have because there's so much that's sort of lost to history, but more importantly, lost to the damage and the sort of fact that the studios weren't kind to the way they took care of their film libraries. Because years ago, if a studio made a motion picture, they weren't thinking about syndication or streaming or home video. They were on to the next production. Um, so, so much of the early cinema um, experience, um, mostly through a lot of nitrate, you know, imploding, uh, has been lost. And but I'm always encouraged and optimistic that new, you know, sort of titles will come out that were considered to be um, lost movies. Uh, we've seen many over the past. One of my favorites, and it has the title Lost in it, is The Lost Horizon with Ronald Coleman. And and uh, Turner Classic Movies is, is screened that movie many, many times, but there's a piece that's kind of, you know, 
it's destroyed a little bit, but they still, you know, they were able to restore it enough to watch the rest of the film. But you always go, oh, I wish that part hadn't been lost, you know. Um, well, there's so much too, if you think about um, even during um, when the Hayes Commission came in and they had the code, you know, where a lot of stuff that was censored was truly just cut on the cutting room floor. So think about um, King Kong, you know, that's a good example of, you know, a film that was censored. Um, and then finding these fragments, finding, you know, the original material to actually sort of reconstruct um, what was lost is, um, is important because so much of um, what I saw as a young kid, you know, that went into syndication packages, they were cut up for commercials, they were using TV prints, you know, that were, you know, kicking around for, you know, years on lesser grade, you know, 16 millimeter redu reduction titles that you, know, you weren't getting the best experience. I remember watching uh, Dracula as a really little kid and you couldn't see anything. I mean, I, I always thought, not to mention that it's, um, it's really hard watching a film like that on kind of like a commercial interruption, but seeing it um, restored and then getting kind of that experience and seeing it in a you know, Blu-ray presentation where it's been all cleaned up, it's like seeing it for the first time. So what we do, what we love is, you know, a lot of the lesser known, lesser appreciated films, um, getting those into new 4K versions and cleaning them up for, you know, either, you know, putting on Turner Classic Movies or on the Film Detective or putting them out on Blu-ray. Um, I think so many films that get relegated into, you know, kind of poor quality, people get bad opinions of them, but it's mostly because they just have never seen them presented in a great version, um, pristine presentation. I, I agree. I just had, do you know Frank Miller? He, he works with Turner Classic Movies. Okay, he just he's he's written some books. He he had a uh, a book um, in Hollywood uncensored, but I had him on the show. Well, actually, the show's going to air soon. But I had him on the show, and he had he created the ultimate um, trivia movie challenge uh, for Turner, actually. And we talked about the censorship, and you know, and the, it was just bizarre what they did. But it's so great to see the movies when they were uncensored, you know, it was pretty risque back in the day. Oh, I, lo I love Free Code. I think that's one of the, you know, most popular. I think film noir and Free Code, especially during TCM, uh, which I'll be attending next week, thankfully. Oh, me time. too. Me too. Well, we'll have to meet in person then. Good. Oh, excellent. That's great. Yeah, um, definitely. Well, it's easy for you because you're out there. Yeah. I just moved to Santa Barbara from Carmel, California. So I'm only an hour and a half away or so. Like that. so um, yeah, that's yeah. a piece of cake. Getting there from Rockport, Massachusetts is a little more challenging. A lot more challenging, yes. And from Carmel, it was like a five and a half hour drive. But still, I'm so happy I'm going to be so close this year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll definitely meet in person. That would be great. For sure. For sure. So let's talk about the resurrection of Fandor. Um, you know, you, uh, it just, it, you know, it would, well, why don't you tell us, because Fandor was around and then, then it stopped being around when, uh, 2018? Something? Yeah, so Fandor came out in um, 2011. 2011, yes. Yeah. And it was um, launched out of San Francisco, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it was one of those sort of um, things that we thought it would be around for a long time because it was serving um, lesser appreciated genre films, foreign films, a lot of great independent films, uh, experimental. So the cinephile world, uh, if you think about kind of what what's a cinephile, you know, it's sort of mostly encompassing all categories and all, you know, genres, but they really know their stuff. So Fandor was truly kind of the first cinephile centric streaming platform, mm -hmm. and it was supported by a great editorial team. And that to me was just the cat's meow. I mean, they were showing classic films, some really edgy stuff, a lot of um, things that you wouldn't see on the mainstream platforms. But sadly, uh, they get into uh, trouble, like a lot of these other companies that fell victim of either a corporate takeover, like Filmstruck, um, which really should never have gone away. Um, but again, victim of circumstance when you have major corporations involved with buying up, you know, 
companies that uh, are trying to program things that they love and they think that the community of film lovers will love. Not necessarily the bean counters at AT and T, um, but with Fandor, we um, we we were looking to acquire it several years ago. We knew that they were in financial trouble and they had effectively had laid everyone off, um, I think in 20, um, 2017 or 2018. So it was a real challenge uh, because the, the industry had uh, changed so much and streaming has become far more competitive than it was when Fandor first launched. And there's so many other platforms and you can truly watch anything anywhere, anytime for the most part. Um, so we, we acquired, well, let me just back up. So the Film Detective was acquired by Cinedime in December of 2020. And two years before we had sold to Cinedime, we were looking to, the Film Detective was looking to acquire Fandor. So I kind of rolled that acquisition into this deal that we did with Cinedime several years ago. And we became a division where we would run the Film Detective our Western channel, Lone Star channel, um, and relaunched Fandor. But the challenge with Fandor was that there were so many people that um, felt burned by it. Um, they, they didn't exit well. Um, they kind of just took off in the middle of the night and kind of you know left a lot of people hanging. So we had our work cut out for us to communicate with distributors, with filmmakers, with, with, with writers and journalists and assure them that we were not, you know, just sort of um, relaunch, but we would make good on, you know, a lot of um, what had not done correctly, make sure everyone that needed to get paid was paid. And uh, when we did relaunch, we had probably talked to about 80 different filmmakers and distributors. And that was um, a huge process for us because we didn't want to come out without kind of the people that had felt burned by the previous um, management. We, we didn't want to come out again until we really were able to talk to everyone and tell them what we we're going to do. And what we have done is we've launched um, with several thousand titles. Uh, we're at film festivals every month, acquiring film and promoting Fandor and doing sponsorships. We just did a big um, promotion with South by Southwest where we gave out an award to an up and coming filmmaker. Right. Uh, and the Fandor New Voices I, Award. I was going to ask you about that, the New Voices Award um, that you presented to Eliana Sosa. And, and her film was What We Leave Behind. I'm, I'm, we're trying to get her on the show. Oh, she, I hope you're doing. Yeah, when the film gets a distributor, sure. we're going to have her on the show. So I think that's, or, or they were waiting or something. You know, so it, it, will, it will definitely get a distributor. Yes, yes. I think I'm not sure if that's what we were waiting for, but anyhow, we we are working on getting her on the show for sure. I really want to talk to her. I it, I was yes, I want to talk to you about that because that's something new, right? Is that something? I mean, that was the first time it was given at South by Southwest, but has Fandor ever been involved before with giving out awards at film festivals? Not that I'm aware of. I think oh. this is um sort of a new thing that we've started. Uh, we've done a lot of new things. You know, we we. We have a podcast. Uh, we have a lot of um, video essays, um, and we have um, a couple of original series in production right now that are kind of geared towards the cinephile. So um, it's different. You know, twenty twenty two streaming is you need your different. You know, you can't. It's not the ten year old kind of playbook anymore. You have to come up with um, engagement tools that are far more creative and uh, meaningful than just having a bunch of titles on a streaming platform. Right, right. You, you have to, and, and, and with Fandor and the Film Detective, you know, we're, we really curate and um, we don't just, you know, run it through data analysis and let AI handle it. It's, it's human beings, it's, you know, editorial. Um, and we're looking at anniversaries and events and uh, seasonal um, holidays. So. You know, it's the stuff that you feel like, you know, you're, when you walk into a video store and you, uh, and it's, it's not Blockbuster, it's sort of like the, your, your local kind of store that the guy who, or woman who owns it, you trust them and you ask them what they recommend. And nine times out of 10, you get something that you love because you trust them. And they're kind of the curators or tastemakers. That's great. I'm so happy. I'm happy it's back, you know, and that, it, it, and it, 
the new improved <laughs> Pandor. Talk the, the film detective. Um, also, I mean, I, I'm going to be having Jennifer Churchill on my show in a few weeks um, because she's just launched on on the film detective. You can talk a little bit about uh, about what she's launched because I think it's wonderful um, on on the film detective and. Tell us about how that came about and, and a little bit more about Film Detective so people understand what the Film Detective is all about. Yeah, so Jennifer Churchill, um, you know, she's in our world. You're in the same world as uh, Jennifer and myself. You know, we're classic film geeks. Um, so she had written her book, you know, Movies Are Magic, which was geared okay. towards kids. And, and I, I had her on my show to talk about that book a number of years ago. Yeah. And, you know, she had kind of pitched us on, you know, doing something, um, which was effectively taking the concept of the book and turning it into a show. And we thought it was a great idea because what are we trying to do if not bring a younger audience to the classics? I mean, really, that's, that's the future. Um, if we don't have other generations of uh, younger people, and, and thankfully at Turner, I see a lot of younger people. Mm -hmm. That's encouraging. But Jennifer's show um, that's on the Film Detective is Classic Films for Kids, and it's uh, co-hosted by her son, Wesson, um, and he's um, great. The two of them are total characters. Um, and we do a lot of um, site locations at some old movie theaters and different places um, that would have some historical context to the film. And Jennifer does these wonderful introductions and talks about the history of the film and contextualizes kind of a story that is for, you know, kids and maybe kids uh, at heart. It doesn't necessarily have to be for children. It, it's just for, you know, kids, you know, that might be older kids. But it's an appreciation of the films to try to really um, bring more enthusiasm without just, you know, what's so great about uh, what we do is that we're able to celebrate a vast array of classic films from the past but without you know sort of the engagement where you have someone talking about it and bringing an audience sort of like you know a gateway of you know let me hold your hand and walk you through this and tell you why you should be interested in it and that's what jennifer does so well is, you know she's a great host and she's um super enthusiastic and knows so much about cinema so this is our first season. It just launched two weeks ago. Our first episode um, was the um, Jack and the Beanstalk with Abbott and Costello from a newly restored um, print. And then um, just mo uh, most recent one that we had last week was the Shirley Temple Little Princess. Love it, love it, love it. So that's on our channel. So if people are not familiar with um, the, the linear world of streaming, we have a live channel, which is just like, you know, Turner Classic Movies or any sort of um, network, but it's a streaming uh, channel and it's available on a lot of these streaming platforms. Um, so we're on Sling TV, we're on Plex TV, we're on Local Now, Distro TV. These are all platforms where you can watch networks, um, but they're streaming. You know, you're not, you're not having to subscribe to Comcast to get them or, you know, some major um, cable booking of and we also have it on our app, which is available on Roku and Apple TV and Amazon Fire TV. So there's lots of ways to watch the film detective. You can also, you know, buy our Blu-rays and engage that way. So besides this um, show that you're doing for children, um, what else can people watch on the film detective? What's the concept behind the film detective for people who don't know? Yeah, so the concept is really all things related to celebrating classic film, lesser known film, and television. You know, one of the other things that we do very well is, you know, we curate some old classic TV shows. So we have everything from Dobie Gillis to Father Knows Best to The Best of Grouch Show. Um, so we, we try to mix in a lot of different things, uh, whether it's creature films or um, a lot of film noir or spaghetti westerns. Um, it's truly kind of a potpourri of all things that are nostalgia based. Uh, we recently launched a uh, podcast series with our friend Carla Mari, um, who is the host of um, 
many syndicated classic radio shows all over the country. And we have, oh man, we must have 40 episodes up right now of the Film Detective Podcast, which is mostly old time radio shows that have some kind of connection that were either made into TV shows or later into serials. And that's hosted by uh, Carl Amari, who's one of the leading authorities in old time radio. And that is also on our channel and also on our app. You're really out there. You're doing some great things. That's wonderful. I did, uh, you did just one, um, let's see, I, mean, I want to read this. You were recently named number four on the make use of list, make use of list of the best 11 streaming services for fans of independent film. That was so long. That's great. I, yeah, it is great. You you know, you're really making, you know, you're doing a lot in a short period of time. Um, and that's amazing. It's amazing. It's wonderful. We're having fun with what we do. I mean, uh, mainly I consider myself um, a film, you know, archive um, manager. And it's, you know, the years of collecting film and working with um, other individuals that were collectors like I was, and then ultimately getting to the point where it became a serious business um, decision for me and, and the pivot point where you know, we took on so much um, and then the commitment to the institutions that we work with that house most of our important film negatives and prints and nitrate. Um, we're very lucky that we have institutions to work in partnership with. So our holdings are all over the place, but they're safe and great facilities like the Library of Congress or you know, the Academy of Motion Pictures or UCLA, uh, Warner Brothers. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know, long after I'm gone, I'm hoping that the world will still embrace wanting to restore these you know, wonderful works of art and treasures that, um, who knew? Who knew that we would be going back to film um, after everything came out on DVD and doing 4K transfers and all these interesting things that improve the quality. And that's why it's just so important to preserve and take care of these um, great titles, because you never know. You never know um, what technology is going to come out next. Exactly, exactly. Um, I used to live in Rochester, New York, which is the home of Kodak and the George Eastman House. And so that's another, I was a block away from the George Eastman House. And that was featured quite a bit in this, the movie I told you about, the documentary um, about restorations of film. And they, you know, talk a lot about that. Um, you know, have you been there? Have you gone to the George Eastman House? Have you been I haven't. I haven't. That's one um location I'd like to be working with that we have not actually done anything with. And they're an important one. Um, yes, they are. Yeah. Yeah. We had an initiative with the um, British Film Institute right before COVID. Um, and that got tabled for a bit, but I'm hoping to get back over there in September to finish this restoration project. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, you're releasing um, different films every month and you're kind of a new restored film. And, and I want to talk a little bit about Dancing Pirate that you just released on Fandor. Can you talk a little bit about what the film is and why it was important and the restoration of that? And we really only have a short period of that, but a 30 I'll seconds. Give, I'll, give you, I'll, give, I'll give you the very short version. So the Dancing Pirate is important because it is an early three strip Technicolor film. And the owner, the original owner of the film um, that I acquired it from was a gentleman by the name of Alex Kogan. Alex passed away a few years ago, but the film was in Australia and it ended up finding its way to Kansas City. And the collector who brought it to Kansas City was a gentleman who we still work with by the name of Wade Williams. Wade sold it to Alex Kogan. Alex Kogan passed away and we had been well aware of this film for many years and we immediately when we acquired his library found the original free strip print restored it and released it on blu-ray and it absolutely um is a title that again when you see it in all these sort of vibrant colors and not the black and white versions that were kicking around on vhs and dvd for many years it's a different film altogether so uh, we have Dancing Pirate um, because of a, a great collector by the name of Alex Kogan, God rest his soul. In Australia, 
you know, too, that you found. Of all places. Of all places that you were, you know, were able to find it. And also that was, it, it, it was nominated for Academy Award for Best Dance Direction. Who knew there was even, you know, uh, uh, an award for that? <laughs> you know? Exactly. You know, that's pretty amazing too. Well, Phil, I think we could talk for hours and hours and hours. Uh, and unfortunately, our time is up, but I, it really is a pleasure talking with you. I look forward to meeting you in person. And uh, thank you for being on the show. Oh, my pleasure, Jen. Look forward to meeting you in person. Yes, definitely. If you have missed any of the Jam Price shows all about movies, please go to my website, thejampriceshow.com, where all the shows are archived, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, the iHeart Podcast Network, Spotify, Google, Apple, wherever you listen. Also go to my YouTube channel and when you're there, subscribe and like it and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Jam Price Show. Thank you all for listening.